Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Plymouth United Church. On this Sunday morning, I'm glad to have you join us. Uh, We are in the middle of Lent, and I hope that your Lenten journey is going well, that you're finding your practices inspiring and comforting and hopeful, and that good things are happening for you uh, this past week, and that you're looking forward to good things in the week to come. I invite you to join me in this time and in this place as we spend a few moments doing some centering. Today we're going to talk about being centered and grounded. And so I invite you to consider your body and where it feels centered and grounded. Where you feel sure-footed, so to speak. And how your body is helping you to be stable. While we consider these positive aspects of our body, we also have to take into consideration that sometimes our bodies don't feel sure-footed, and sometimes our bodies are not feeling particularly stable. And how is your body feeling in all ways? And can the stable part of your body help to assist the parts of you physically that aren't feeling quite so sure-footed, that aren't feeling that aren't feeling confident. Take a deep breath into your body as we move to the thinking aspect of ourselves. And where are you stable in your thoughts? Where are you sure-footed in your thinking, in your mind? And where are you not so sure-footed Where does it feel like things are a little shifty under your feet in your thinking process? And how can that aspect of your mind and your thinking that is not feeling quite so sturdy lean on the stable part of your thoughts so that you can merge your body with your mind as we move to the emotional aspect of our being and find ourselves more and more feeling stable in this moment. And so in your emotions, where do you find yourself secure? Where do you find that your emotions are are experiencing what you kind of expect given the circumstances that you're in or the situations that you're in the midst of? Where do you um, experience your emotions being reliable? And where are you experiencing your emotions not being so reliable? Feeling a little questionable about where your emotions are going and where your feelings are taking you. And is there a way to stabilize some of that, those emotions that aren't quite doing what you expect by linking them to the emotions that are feeling more reliable and stable? Because none of us are perfect at any given time, in any given way. And yet there are, in each of us, aspects where we do feel like we're on solid ground these aspects of our being and at the same time we know that we're on shaky ground and we're not sure if we can stand all that can be true at the very same time and so we breathe into this moment allowing all those truths to come to the surface as we consider our spirit the spiritual aspect of ourselves and where our spirit does feel reliable and stable and grounded and centered. And where our spirit feels shaken and broken and unsure. Knowing that both of these two things can exist at the very same time one aspect of our spirit can lean on the other aspect of our spirit to find its grounding and its center. And we weave that 
spiritual aspect of ourselves into the emotional aspect and the mental aspect and the physical aspect as we breathe deep into the fullness of ourselves knowing that it is not in our perfection that we find hope or that we can rejoice and celebrate but it is in the fullness of our being that we can find this hope in all the ways that we are and we breathe into this moment together being fully human one with another as we co-create this sacred moment with each other in this time and in this place. And now I invite you to join us as we sing together. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. We rejoice in the divine as we make our way through this Lenten journey. In the wilderness, our hunger is filled with holy hope. In the desert, our thirst is quenched from the stream of God's presence. On the road to Jerusalem, our weariness is transformed into strength by grace. We each walk our own journey as led by spirit. We all walk together as the body of Christ in the world. Hi kids, good morning. Um, come gather around. I want to tell you a story again. I want to use this book, Stories for Kids Who Dare to Be Different, like I did some, uh, sometimes last month. This is a story about a woman named Jessica Cox. She was born in 1983. And it says, Jessica had dreamed of flying from a young age. She would get frustrated with being different from everyone else and found that imagining herself soaring through the sky above them all helped. What made her different? Jessica was born with a rare birth defect. She has no arms. She wore prosthetic arms because she felt she needed them to fit in. The arms were heavy and would get uncomfortable in the Arizona heat. At the age of 14, she made one of the biggest decisions of her life and decided to stop wearing them. Instead, she embraced her difference learning how to handle everyday tasks with her feet. She hasn't looked back since. Jessica drives, swims, dances, scuba dives, surfs, holds a degree in psychology, and has three black belts in Taekwondo, which she won competing against people with both arms. She never felt disabled. She just knew she was differently abled. She also learned to fly. As she was learning, she had to find ways to do everything she needed to do in a plane, from buckling the seatbelt to starting the engine. Jessica didn't let it stop her. It took two instructors with four planes across three states, but she finally got her pilot's license after three years of training. It had been a long journey. In 2013, Jessica 
flew to Ethiopia. There, she met an eight-year-old boy named Tariku, who had also been born without arms. They ate together with their feet, and Tariku introduced Jessica to injera, a kind of pancake bread popular in Africa. Seeing her fly herself out of his village on a plane, he must have felt there was nothing in the world he wasn't capable of. Jessica's advice for people feeling isolated because of their disabilities, develop self-confidence in your special abilities because there are things you can offer the world that other people can't. Isn't that a great story? I think it reminds us that God has given us all different kinds of abilities and what we look at as things that we're not able to do, um, and when we only focus on those, then, then we're focused on ourselves outside of the gifts that God has given us. Now, that's not to say that things weren't challenging. She certainly had her share of challenges. But she met those challenges, and she overcame them in the way that she lived into the gifts that God has given her. And I want you to live into the gifts that God has given you. Are you perfect? Nope, you're not. Am I perfect? Is anybody at Plymouth or in the world perfect? Nope, not even a little bit. But we don't have to be perfect so that we can live into our gifts and be the person that God created us to be. So don't be afraid of those really cool things that you can do. And don't be afraid of those really cool things that you aren't gifted to do, but somebody else is. Because we all have different kinds of gifts that we get to share with each other. And if we didn't, well, actually, I think it'd be a lot less fun. So would you join me in prayer? Oh God, we thank you for the gifts that you've given to each of us. And we thank you that we get to share gifts one with another. We also thank you that we're made of different stuff. And the fact that we get to share means that the world becomes a little bigger and a little more beautiful and a little more exciting and inspiring. Help us to grow by not looking only at what we can't do, but at really focusing on what each of us can do and help us to also grow by inspiring each other to do those things with as much enthusiasm as we possibly can. Thank you for creating us in the way that you have. We love you, God, and we know that you love us. And all God's people said, Amen. Our biblical witness this morning is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and then 16 through 19. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the divine parent and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk in Christ, rooted and built up in Christ, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit, according to the tradition of mortals, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Christ who is the head of all principality and power. So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility or worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by this fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Our contemporary witness today is an excerpt from Hope is Disarray by Grace G. Sun Kim. Fact-checking is simple in the information age, 
Regardless of who you are, exaggerations and embellishments are now easy to debunk with a quick internet search. Most of the time, fact-checking exposes an audience to a plethora of stories that would otherwise remain hidden or unknown. But in more recent times, it has lost its purpose and responsibility, algorithmically customized to suit one's internet history. It gives us the facade of diverse opinions and a breath of news coverage, but in reality, it offers a thinly skewed sketch of what is happening in the world based on clickbait titles hand-fed to us by artificial media curation. Our brief online schemings of the world have given many of us the false idea that we are informed, knowledgeable, and worthy of distributing information that we ourselves are not sure is factual. In the letter Paul wrote to the Colossians, he's dealing with a problem. People who are not a part of the church are trying to tell the people of the church how to perform their faith practice, what to think, what to believe, things like that. These new churches of Paul's were developing their own rituals and understandings of, of what it meant to be a community of faith based on who they were and the culture they lived in. Outsiders were trying to control them rather than becoming a part of their community. People were hearing bits and pieces of what was happening with these new faith groups and deciding what it all meant and how they should change. They were also fostering fear about them and leaping to the worst possible conclusions. There were some terrible rumors about the early believers. The tidbits of description going around about the Lord's Supper ended up describing them as cannibals. Because they didn't believe in the pantheon of gods, the Romans declared that they were atheists, and there were accusations of immorality because they called each other siblings and based their faith on love. This is how rumors of incest began, as if the Christians were doing that. When we fear something, we clutch at the latest disparaging information and make something big out of it, regardless of whether it's accurate. That's what they were doing to the early church. That's also what happens today. Grace Ji Sun Kim talks about this in her book, Hope in Disarray. She points out how we curate information based on the bubble we want to live in. This can happen no matter what party you belong to, what faith you express, or ideology you adhere to. Paul was dealing with the same thing, but without the technology. This isn't a, a new or a now problem. It's a human problem, and it's fear-based. One of the teachings of Paul which really strikes me in this part of the letter that we read is when he says, so let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. All of our celebrations and rituals, all of our beliefs and practices, these are shadows. They are our best attempts at reaching toward the divine and performing our faith as a community. They aren't meant to be right. Our words are not meant to be eternal truths. They are ways of giving shape to that which is amorphous, of giving voice to the ineffable. In and of themselves, they are significant. Our intention to the practices, well, with that, they become powerful. But they don't stand alone. And they're not the absolute truth or the essence of power. The first chapter of the Tao Te Ching, the first few lines of it, I think sums it up pretty well. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. This is what I think Paul is talking about when he says our practices are the shadow, but the substance for the Christian is Christ. Grace Jisoo Kim says we are offered clickbait titles had hand-fed to us by artificial media curation. The, the danger of clickbaits is that they're meant to misdirect us. They grab our attention and then lure us off by something vaguely meaningful and then lead us in another direction. It's a purposeful attempt to hook us emotionally and bring us to a place we never intended. 
The technology aspect of it is new, but the intention is not. For instance, early television advertising used subliminal messages to sell products. In 1957, these kinds of ads were made illegal. And there are loopholes, of course, as there are with any rules. So we're still subjected today to advertising, which is less than straightforward. But the point is that as technology develops, people use it to misdirect and to influence in less than obvious ways. During Lent, we have the opportunity to practice being grounded, especially in our faith. Rumors may fly around about any given thing, vaccines, the election, what happened to the power grid in Texas. For as long as there have been people, there have been escalated conversations meant to sensationalize. We don't have to be taken captive by the rise of voices and the emotional whiplash they perpetrate. This kind of approach isn't new, and it doesn't need to take us by surprise. It's a human thing. It's something Paul was warning and sending comfort to his people about. There are just different ways to do it in each generation. What are we to do? In Paul's teaching, paraphrased for our time, I would say, don't take the bait. Easier said than done. So, so what is it that helps us to not get lured in? Grace G. Sun Kim suggests that to receive grace is to live through grace. I kind of love that. Paul teaches that we walk in Christ, rooted and built up in Christ, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Fear makes people do strange things. Grace and thanksgiving are tenets of our faith which counter fear. They ground us. When we aren't afraid, we listen better, and we respond rather than react. We're less likely to get sucked into clickbait and rumors, less likely to get thrown off our game because of the inflammatory remarks and malicious misdirection. When when Paul talks about being rooted in Christ, I think about being grounded, centered. This allows us to be open because we're more sure-footed. The wind doesn't blow us down as if we're standing on loose gravel in a high wind. As we continue on this Lenten journey, find your footing. Know that you don't have to have ultimate truth or perfect faith practices. All you have to do is reach toward holy love with the means and the ways that you have to do it. After all, holy love is the substance, the ground that we are rooted in. And with that, my friends, I leave you peace. Loving God, lead us beyond ourselves to care and protect, to nourish and shape, to challenge and energize both the life and the world you have given us. God of light and God of darkness, God of conscience and God of courage, lead us through this time of spiritual confusion and public uncertainty 
Lead us beyond fear, apathy, and defensiveness to new hope in you and to hearts full of faith. Give us the conscience it takes to comprehend what we're facing, to see what we're looking at, and to say what we see, so that others, hearing us, may also brave the pressure that comes with being out of public step. Give us the courage we need to confront those things that compromise our conscience or threaten our integrity. Give us, most of all, the courage to follow those before us who challenged wrong and changed it, whatever the cost, to themselves. Good morning, everyone. Today's announcements will be brought to you by Shelby Mack. During this time when we are not gathered in person, we have created several opportunities for gathering together on Zoom. Sunday mornings at 10, before the service begins, we meet for a time of fellowship. On Wednesday evening at 6.30, we have our book study group. And on Friday evening at 7, Judy Walden hosts a small group discussion related to the current reflective topic. You can find a link to these in our Thursday Thought Newsletter or on our Facebook page. However, we do have an opportunity to meet in person. Weather permitting, we hold an outdoor afternoon service in the back field of the church. It begins at 1.30 p.m. Please bring a chair. The bulletin is sent via email Sunday morning. If you would like to be on our email list for our newsletter or other mailings, please contact Melanie C. at PlymouthUnited.org. We had a minor setback at church. Last weekend, another part of the ceiling in the choir room fell down. Early Tuesday morning, the demolition crew returned to remove the rest of the choir room ceiling and to clean up the mess. We are still waiting for our insurance estimate and to schedule the next step with the company doing the demolition, cleanup, and rebuild. Currently, our systems upgrade campaign has reached a little over $11,000. Thank you to everyone who has given and is considering a gift. The money we collect will go towards whatever insurance doesn't cover and to repiping the church. If we collect enough money, we also want to upgrade our electric system, which is problematic. If you are able to participate in this campaign, please mark your gift, Systems Upgrade Campaign. Another opportunity to gather together is our Spring Equinox Labyrinth Walk, Sacred Fire, and Drum Circle. Please join us Saturday, March 20th at 6.30 p.m. for a time of reflection and celebration. Each week, we collect two offerings. One is for the church, which goes into our general fund for the running of the church and our ministries. The second is the loose offering, which is sent to a designated charity, which changes each week. Today's loose offering will go to One Great Hour of Sharing, which is one of the five UCC offerings. They provide emergency and long-term assistance to people in the aftermath of hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, floods, tidal waves, fires, explosions, technology disasters, civil strife, war, or other natural or human-caused events. If you would like to give to our general fund or to the loose offering or both, you can use bill pay from your bank, send us a check, or use push pay according to the directions on your screen. As always, thank you for supporting Plymouth and the ministries of the loose offering. Introducing something new, a simpler way to give to Plymouth. Just text PUC Give to 77977 and you will receive a text back with a link to PushPay where you can complete your gift. Once in PushPay, you can enter your amount and then designate your gift under the Fund drop down where you can choose from the options of General Fund for My Giving, Loose Offering for our weekly missions and outreach, Other, or our new campaign for systems upgrade. Choose to give one time or make it a recurring gift. Lastly, you can pay directly from your bank account or by card. And that's it! For a new super simple way to give to Plymouth, just text PUC Give to 77977. <music>
is God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God for all that love has done. Creator Christ and Spirit Please join me in our responsive offertory prayer, which was written by Reverend Joanna Harader. God of the journey, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts, with open hands. Amen. And now, my friends, it is time to go from this moment to whatever it is that you have next. May you find the peace and the love and the joy that holy love gives you. And may it be found by you, whether it's in an exuberant fashion or just a, a small corner in the essence of your being. May it be something that that grows and that becomes watered and that blooms and that the beauty of it gets shared around all over so that others have seeds planted and watered and they can bloom so that together we can become something that is much bigger together than we ever could be by ourselves go forth in the groundedness of spirit and what that groundedness means for you, for your friends, and for your family. Go forth in peace and as peacemakers. <laughs>